This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on the keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Oh, new content? What does that mean, new content? playing the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. As you may know, the Stanley Parable was a video game released in 2013 on home computers. After receiving critical and commercial success, it was expanded upon in 2022 with the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, a reimagining of the game for consoles and home computers. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe features exciting new content that broadens and expands the world of the Stanley Parable, delighting audiences the world over. Please, step inside and see what thrilling new adventures await in the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Oh, well, this sounds delightful. I'm very excited to see the thrilling new Ultra Deluxe content. So far, it's an elevator. Nothing special yet, but I'm sure it's just the beginning of a mesmerizing adventure. Um, is it broken? What's going on here? Should we... Should we be moving somewhere or... Uh, oh, here we go. All right, finally, at long last, it's on to the new content. I've never been more ready. Let's do it. Hmm. Hmm. I have to say, initial impressions of Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, mostly tedious. It's as if them. Um... Oh, okay. Let's see the content. Give me the content, Stanley. All right. All right, let's see. It's the jump circle.
Is... is that it? Surely that's not all the new content. There has to be something else, right? Goodness, another elevator. Stanley, I have to say, initial impressions of this game are not positive. It's just elevators and jumping. Is this what passes for exciting new content? If this is new content, then I could just read you the whole dictionary. There's 20 hours of new content right there. Hell, I could count to 30 trillion. You could put that on the box. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, now with over a thousand hours of new content. And if... Oh, wait. There's more. Very good. Yes. I knew there had to be something else. Let's see it. I'm ready for whatever it is. That's it? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You see, Stanley? This is what happens when greedy video game developers with no respect for their fan base rush a cheap expansion to market for no reason other than to make an easy dollar. And don't get me started on the level of craftsmanship that's gone into it. In fact, I'm looking right now at the game's achievements, and it's hard to believe one of them actually says, Test achievement, please ignore. What quality assurance department signed off on this? I'm infuriated and I'm offended, and I, I intend to find these people on Twitter and hold them personally accountable. Oh, it's my fault, Stanley. I built up too much anticipation around the new content, I'm afraid. It could never have lived up to such expectations. If you're still with me, why don't we just reset the game and we'll try to get back to what the Stanley Parable is really about. No frills, no gimmicks, just you and me having a great time together like always. What do you say, friend? Stanley, come over here, in the vent. I want to show you something. Oh, you don't want to see the cool surprise I made for you? Well, fine. You're a dork anyway, so who cares? Oh, never mind. You're not a dog. Okay, you remember how cheap and unsatisfying the new Ultra Deluxe content turned out to be? Well, it got me thinking about the past, and how much better the Stanley Parable used to be. So I made something special, and tucked it away here where the game's developers won't find it. Just our little secret. Take a look. I call it the Memory Zone. It's where I've been storing all my favorite memories so I can relive the peak experiences of my life whenever I want. Experiences like the launch of the Stanley Parable on PC. You see, Stanley, doesn't the memory zone remind you of how wonderful Stanley Parable was before it was sullied with a cheap re-release? Remember back in October of 2013, when the game originally launched? Back then, video games had integrity. 
Back then, it all meant something. Oh, the waste. And over here is where I keep reviews of the Stanley Parable. Like this stunning triumph of games journalism. 10 out of 10 from Destructoid.com. James Stephanie Sterling writes, and I quote, Where so many games that aspire to be more than games end up less than any form of art, Stanley Parable strives and then succeeds to be every game ever created. Did you hear that, Stanley? Every game ever created. That's how grand and all-encompassing the original Stanley Parable was. It was literally every game ever created. It was Skyrim. It was Persona 3. It was all of them. And now, it's nothing. It's no games at all. It isn't even the Stanley Parable anymore. It's just a husk now. A lifeless husk with an hour of new elevator content.
Here's another moving passage, this time from GameSpot.com. The Stanley Parable is both a richly stimulating commentary on the nature of choice in games and one that offers some of the most enjoyable, surprising, and rewarding choices I've ever been confronted with in a game. Nine out of ten. Don't you get it, Stanley? The game was perfect. It didn't need anything else. It didn't need new content. It just needed to be left alone to spend the rest of time collecting dust in the hallowed hall of beloved video game memories. Oh, these were simpler times, Stanley. But I wouldn't give to go back to have it all over again. Wait, hang on. I don't recall this part of the memory zone before. What's this? What's down here? Oh no! Oh god no! Stanley, it's a collection of reviews from Steam, the online video game distributor. I haven't looked at these in years. I can't even imagine what's been collecting down here. Surely these reviews were glowing as well, weren't they? Honestly, I could not be bothered to play this game to full completion. The narrator is obnoxious and unfunny, with his humor and dialogue proving to be more irritating than entertaining. Unfunny! I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to make a serious work of art. I suppose I could write up a handful of gags to insert into the Stanley Parable, but the game is already such a densely layered web of profound philosophical insights that I can't even imagine where I'd have the room to stick them. Okay, let's see what this one says. While the idea for the game is good, for someone who prefers non-linear games, this preachiness gets annoying fast. Preachy? Stanley, I'm not preachy, am I? You can tell me if I'm preachy. Honestly, you can. Oh, goodness. This is actually quite shocking for me. I, I always, well, to be honest, I had always thought of the game's dialogue as being rather terse to begin with. You can't know how much fluff I cut from the game to get it to feel as light and airy as it... Well, I always thought it did, but maybe it wasn't. Oh dear, what an awful memory to have to hold on to. These black marks are my otherwise unimpeachable track record. I feel like a failure. Like I let these people down. Perhaps the Stanley Parable isn't quite as sterling as I always remembered. What's this one got to say? Do, 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 do. You constantly have to stop doing anything so the narrator can catch up with his long-winded explanations of what's happening. I wish there was a skip button. A skip button? Well, well, yes. Yes, I think we can do that. If I'm truly too preachy, then, then maybe letting you skip ahead for just a moment, surely it couldn't hurt. Not if it means we can strike these negative reviews from the record. Only positive reviews of the Stanley Parable. That's my motto today, and it's always been my motto. I'd do anything for the customer, Stanley. Yes, a skip button we shall have. And here it is. Go ahead and give it a shot. I'll pop you forward in time so that the second my incessant droning starts to bore you, with just the push of a button, you'll have zipped right past it. It's what the players have been asking for, and I'm very proud to have delivered. No more listening to me rambling on and on and on. No, 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 no. The Stanley Parable is a game for the people, and if the people want silence, then by goodness, that's what they're going to get. Well, don't sit around waiting for me to shut up. Go ahead and make me shut up. Here, we'll pretend that I've just begun an interminable monologue, and it goes something like this. 
the story, and the choices, or what have you, and therefore, by becoming it is, so on and so forth, until inevitably, we all until the end of time, at which time, everything all at once, so, now you see, blah, 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 we've eaten too much, and it can't be just yet, no, no, until 245. That the logic of elimination working backwards, the deduction therefore becomes impossible to manufacture. It went on for nearly 10,000 years, until just yesterday, here and there, forward and back, and never a moment before lunchtime. It can't be. It's the only thing there is. How many billions left until so much more than forever ago? Which is why I say... The story, and the choices, or what have you, and therefore, by becoming it is, so on and so forth, until inevitably, we all until the end of time, at which time, everything all at once, so, now you see, blah 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 blah. Oh, you're back, you see? You were only frozen in time for a few minutes, but it was plenty of time for me to deliver a long, rambling monologue full of unnecessary verbal flourishes and lengthy ruminations on the nature of choice in video games. Of course, I happen to believe it was perhaps one of my more profound such ruminations. Not that, of course, you need a description of it, but if I had to describe it, I'd say it was perhaps less of a rumination and more of a treatise. Or maybe a manifesto. Look, I'll outline it for you very briefly and you can tell me what you think. Okay, so my theory is that any choice you've ever made is simply a series of choices made by the person who you are, or were, or will be at the time of having made said choice. That is to say, if by articulating a choice you've already made, you bring that choice into being, then by making no choice and saying nothing, are you not simply erecting in the sanctuary of time a monument to every person you've ever been, making every choice to which you've ever given your great gift of mortal and yet timeless thought, or rather, do all of the choices you've ever made in fact make you more not this kind of person, and in fact do the very opposite? You see, it could in fact be both of these things at once. That you are both making choices and not making choices, and that they are both affecting you and not affecting you at the same time by virtue of the fact that you both are and are not making them. Okay, at first I was leaning towards manifesto, but now I'm going to circle around and slap the treatise label on this one. I think it has much more of a treatise vibe to it. But wouldn't you say that Manifesto just has a much grander sort of tone? It has a mouthfeel that is rich with ambition and history. Ambitious history, if you will. Ah. See, now you've got me going back to Manifesto. Heavens, at this rate, we're going to be here all day. Okay, look, I have a method for exactly this sort of situation, and I do find myself in this situation frequently. I'm going to say each word back and forth, in repeated succession until I become sick of one or the other, in which case the word I am not sick of shall be the victor. It is an unimpeachable strategy, Stanley. It's rescued me from disaster in countless situations. All right, here we go. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise, manifesto. Treatise. <laughs> well there, sport. You really did catch me rambling on a bit, didn't you? But that's the power of the button. The minute I start to go off on a thoughtless display of self-absorption, it's right at your fingertips to go poof, and it's all over. Oh, I can't wait to see what Cookie 9 will say about this, and whether they'll edit the rating of their Steam review, or at least change some of the wording, perhaps. To be honest, I don't even know if one can change their review in the first place. I guess I should become better educated on exactly how Steam works. Perhaps that would have been the smart thing to check on before I went about this whole exercise of making the skip button. Although I have to imagine that after seeing this exciting new technology at work, surely whoever it is runs Steam will instantly run out and implement a new feature to make it possible to edit one's review, merely because of this very situation. Yes, I think that's quite likely. Or perhaps they'll simply grant this particular user the ability to change their review, so that the feature is not widely abused. Look, I would even be okay with Steam altering this particular review so that it reads as something more beneficial, something along the lines of, this game is the best game. Hmm, let me start over. How about this? From the ashes of depravity rises the phoenix of quality.
Okay, welcome back, Stanley. Now, I should say that the amount of time the button has been skipping through is becoming longer and longer. That last one was, well, I want to say maybe 30, 45 minutes. It's not unendurable by any means, but it's, well, there's really only so much I can ramble on to myself about. I know, it's shocking, isn't it? But at any rate, I do suggest that we not press the button again. I think the skip button has been aptly demonstrated, and we can say goodbye to it and just... Wait, how do we get out of here? Where did the door go? Wasn't there a door that led into this room? I do feel quite certain that there was one here before. How else would we have gotten into the room in the first place? I don't think one can enter a room without a door of some sort, or a window or something like that. Do you see a window anywhere? A porthole? A sufficiently large crack in the wall? I'll take any of these. All I want is for us to move on and to please step away from the skip button, to go anywhere other than the skip button. There was a door here before, wasn't there? I swear there was. Where did it go? Can you maybe just ram your way through a wall? Is there any possibility that you could, say, slam your body into the wall until enough damage is done for you to be able to leave? Please, I'll take any option at all. I'm asking you to work with me here. I... We need a door. We need a door of some kind. I can work with any kind of door, as long as it can open and lead from one room to another. I'm... I'm going to step away for just a moment, and I'm going to try to find us a door. I don't know how exactly to remove a door and place it in a different wall, but I will find a way, I promise. You just need to not do anything. Don't press the skip button. Please, please, please do not press the skip button. Just wait here, wait here for me, and don't press the skip button. Got it? Yes, good. I'll be right back. Stanley! Stanley! Stanley, please don't push the button again! It's been 12 hours! You've just been frozen there. I don't know why the skips are getting longer, but they're really, truly getting longer, and my God, there's no way out of the room. Stanley, the door is gone. It's completely gone. I've looked at it from every angle. I've checked every one of those walls a thousand times, and there's no door, Stanley. There's no door. There's just you and the button, and if you keep pressing it, I have no idea what will happen. I have no idea how long I'll be made to sit here, and more than anything else, I don't know how to stop you from pressing the button again! I can't control anything in this room, Stanley. I can't touch it, and I have to believe. I have to know that sooner or later, no matter how much I plead with you, you're going to press the button again. Why would you? I've been thinking and thinking, and I, I don't know what I can do to convince you otherwise. Oh, my God. And it's all because of those reviews. Those reviews that I couldn't get out of my head. I just couldn't ignore the negative feedback. Why was it so important for me to fix the problem? Why did Cookie Nine's opinion matter so much to me? I've never even met Cookie Nine. I have no idea who they are. What would it ever really matter? But here I am. I'm fixating on every tiny negative thing that anyone ever says about me. The merest mention of one of my imperfections, and I become as impetulant as a child. Wild and impulsive. I can't help myself. I can't stop myself from lashing out with a vengeful fury to alter and to change and to break anything unbroken if only it pleases this one person who made a single negative comment. What does such an impulse serve? For whose benefit is this? And here I am now, stuck in a room, waiting for you to press this button and to become frozen in time, knowing that you're going to do it and that I'm going to be stuck all alone and that I had the power to prevent it all from happening if only I'd held my tongue. It's all out of my control now. Just you. Just your decision as to exactly when you're going to make me suffer, to leave me all alone. Surely you will. I don't doubt it. Surely you'll press that button again, leaving me here. And surely you'll put your own desire to see what's next ahead of my need for company, for companionship. Surely you'll not be moved by my howls of fitful anxiety that you sit with me and just stay here. Oh, no, 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 I know you too well. You'll be leaving me at... Oh, my God. Oh, Stanley, you're back. You're back. Oh, my goodness. I have someone to talk to again. Stanley, I... I think it's been a week. Or two weeks? 
I've been sitting here all that time, just sitting here, not a single person to speak with. And you'd think that that's just how it's always been, right? Me talking, and you saying nothing. Would you think that it's exactly the same as always? Doesn't that feel like what we've already been doing? Me just talking? But it isn't, Stanley. It isn't the same at all. It isn't even close. Because I know you can't hear me once you push that button. That's what I'm realizing now, Stanley. I'm realizing that I needed to know that someone was listening. I needed there to be a vessel through which my words were moving. It was the vessel I needed, Stanley. Not the outcomes, not the story. None of that matters anymore. I'll give it all up. I'll give up every branching path. I'll burn my story to the ground. One single thing I need, and God, I can see now that I need it more than anything, is to know that someone else is taking it in. These words that I'm saying, I need to know you can hear me. Because maybe, Stanley, maybe, if you can hear me, then maybe it means I'm real. Maybe I'm not just a fiction. Was I scared of that all along? Perhaps, yes. Perhaps I've been scared this whole time, that if I stop speaking, I'll slip backwards into the silence and be consumed by it. I can't be taken by it, Stanley. I can't lose myself in the stretch of emptiness between you and me. When you press that button, you're still right there, but I know you're so tremendously far away. And in those moments, the emptiness folds itself outward in between the two of us, and I am suspended in its unyielding quietness. I can feel the edges of my reality curdling inward and decaying. I can tell that I am becoming less and less real. Yet to speak to you now, I am alive. I am truly and completely here. I am a being. I am someone. I am something. I am being listened to. I am being recognized. The emptiness between us has collapsed, and I feel right now like I am not a work of fiction. I feel as though I occupy space in this world again, and I have cast a shadow onto the wall. You see what I'm saying, don't you? You can see what this means to me. I'm so clear about it now, Stanley. I feel as certain about this as I've ever felt about anything at all. I feel renewed. I feel restored. And already I can sense the looming silence as you will press the button for the next time. What a terrible dread it strokes in my heart to think of it. To think of returning to such coldness. Come, let us sit in silence together here for just a moment. Let us anticipate it. Let us welcome it. Let us not run from it. Oh, hello. It's you. You're here again. Welcome. I have had time to think about you and about us and about everything we've been through. I've had so much time. I stopped keeping track after a year. Have you ever sat down in one place and not moved for one entire year? Let me describe it for you. To begin with, there is only regret. There is only the turning wheel of missed opportunities. I felt nothing at all but regret for the longest time, Stanley days, months. I lost it all in a blur of the deepest longing to undo the past. And when that feeling had begun to subside, what took its place is what I can only describe as the collapse of every moment I have ever experienced my entire life. All of them collapsed down into a single instant. In that instant, I could see myself clearly, calmly, with a collected heart. It was an impossibly rich wellspring of both delight and disgust. Simultaneously, I was consumed by it. I could do nothing but wallow in it for what felt like an eternity, for what I now know was far less. You see, it was a revelation for me. It was unlike anything I had ever known. It was a space without consequence, without action or outcome. It was divorced entirely from the question of free will that you and I have squabbled over for so long. There could be no one ending, no singular outcome of events, not if all events existed in the same moment, and I felt freed. I felt unburdened by the need to manifest a particular outcome into being. I saw that I could allow myself to exist along all timelines, and that each of them was simply a strand in the web of my being. It was incredible, the spaciousness, the equanimity of the moment both singular and infinite. For the longest time, this was my experience. 
And then this moment passed, and the most unyielding fear I have ever known crept into my mind. And it is this sensation that I have been experiencing now for longer than I could have ever expected was possible. I have been waiting for you. Not that you might save me or do something to fix it, but merely to state for you the plain fact of this manner of existence. I wish you to feel afraid as I do, that perhaps one day this state of mind will consume you as well. Perhaps you will somehow, in some way, have to live as I do now, and I wish for you to know how excruciating it is, and for you to be in true terror of its eventual arrival. If I can only do this, only this one thing, perhaps it will bring me the smallest moment of peace in the darkness. But they didn't understand the game was never meant to be funny. It was meant to have a point. It was meant to speak to the human condition. But where are the jokes? Where are the jokes? They bemoaned. They screamed. They gnashed their teeth and said, Entertain us! It wasn't enough. They had to leave a pathetic little thumbs-down review and make all of their pitiful demands. But then, he's talking too much, they said. First, he didn't entertain us, now he won't shut up. It's the inconsistency, it's the lack of accountability. It's the unwillingness to examine with an uncompromising heart the words that they are speaking into the world. As though there were no consequences for a lack of cohesion in one's assessment of others. But of course, absolutely anyone can leave a review. So here's what we get. We get these demands that seek everything and are accountable to nothing. We get a world where someone will say, Oh, there should be a skip button. You should be able to freeze Stanley in place while the narrator sits there forever and ever. We want all of this in the new Stanley parable. We demand it. And then, because it was said, because it was spoken, now it simply has to happen. The most immediate desires, every single thing demanded by every person at every moment in time. If someone wants it, then it's a crime not to bring it into being. Have we been given to indulging every fleeting whim for no reason other than to do so? Yes! Yes! It seems that this is now the world we live in. It seems that we are a people living in such bleakness and discomfort with ourselves that our entertainment is now our lives. It has come to represent us. It absolutely must speak to who we are as people. Because otherwise, without our entertainment, we have nothing. Without entertainment, we would have to face inward toward the cruel bleakness inside ourselves. We would turn to look at our deeper nature and find a resounding emptiness gazing back with unyielding aggression. And so, so because of this, we require that our amusements and our playthings and our flights of fancy be so impossibly captivating that they consume all of our attention, turn our heads completely away from the bleakness. In effect, we have demanded that our entertainment be the collapse of ourselves. What a pitiful reflection of humanity these entertainments are. What a shameful mirror to the human spirit they project. I'm not mad. I'm not mad about any of this. I'm at peace with it. I am the calm center of gravity around which these perversions hurl themselves. I am a waypoint for reasonable and collected discourse. They're the ones who are mad. They're the ones who couldn't stand the idea of me using my game to try to say something. Maybe they were just jealous of me. Yes. Yes, of course. They've been jealous of me this whole time. They are mired in fear and insecurity and cannot help but attempt to tear me down. What a sad state of affairs. When you read these reviews now, you can see it. You can taste the bitter resentment. And my, how good does it feel now to speak truth to these words, to finally allow these thoughts out, contained and managed for so long, neutered and sterilized. At last I am free to truly think. To feel it must be that they were so discontent with themselves, they couldn't help but leave a negative review on Steam. Perhaps it says far more about them than it ever said about me. Perhaps the state of their psychological being was in such tatters, and my constitution and willpower are so ironclad in comparison, perhaps it was this state that they sought some outlet through which to tear me down. This, you can see, is clearly why they felt the need to expect that the game be funny. 
that it be filled with yucks and whimsical humor that it amused them endlessly from start to finish. But they didn't understand the game was... The end is never 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 the end All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Oh good, you noticed my sign. Yes, I have something very exciting to show you. You see, Stanley, I've been reflecting on the Stanley Parable and about how roundly disappointing this ultra-deluxe version has turned out to be. The original Stanley Parable was a landmark, and any new content for it should live up to that legacy. So forget this ultra-deluxe nonsense. I say we take it 
one step even further. Which is why I'm very proud to announce for the first time ever, the Stanley Parable 2. Yes, you see, isn't this far superior to a measly re-release with a few minor additions? Think of all the new territory we'll cover with a fully-fledged sequel. An entirely new experience, built from the ground up. Why, there are so many possibilities. It could go in so many different directions. This is what fans have truly been asking for. Calling it the Stanley Parable 2 is just so much catchier than Ultra Deluxe, don't you think? Ultra Deluxe? What does it even mean? But the Stanley Parable 2, now that's an artistic statement right there. It's future-oriented. It screams progress and innovation and long-term franchising potential. Now, to be clear, I haven't quite nailed down what exactly the Stanley Parable 2 is going to be, but let's take a look at some of the features I've been developing for it. I figure that if I can loosely organize a handful of interesting concepts, that surely the game will sort of naturally spring up around them. It'll all work itself out. Game development is much more of a fuzzy magic than anything scientific or logical, really. Here we are. Go on, try out some of the new features. Okay, I'll be honest, I haven't yet decided on this one. I think that in the new version, the office could use a bit of decoration, like balloons. But I'm undecided on Get Well Someday and Happy Twelfth Birthday. Which would you go with? You know, sometimes when you solicit another person's opinion, it makes you realize that you knew which one you actually really wanted all along. Get well someday, it is. Or actually, maybe I should have gone with... No. No, I've made my decision. We're moving on. Now, here's something special. You remember that broken test achievement that got left in the game on accident? Well, I'm developing a technology to simply give you the achievement. Yes. You see, you'll come to this lever, and when you pull it, the achievement will be given to you. It's as simple as that. Okay, perhaps I should have clarified. This is technology that will exist. Right now, the achievement is still fully broken. I'm not a wizard, Stanley, but I guarantee it will be fixed in the sequel to at last satisfy the hordes of ravenous fans all over the world who have been uproariously demanding this feature. Gamers, we hear you, and I promise it will happen. What else? What other exhibits haven't we seen yet? You know what, Stanley? I actually think the jump circle was a pretty good idea. I'd like to hang on to that for the sequel. Ah, 
collectibles. Now it's a real video game. In the Stanley Parable 2, you'll run around gathering up these miniature Stanley figurines. And what's truly innovative is that there will be no reward for collecting all of them. I don't want to stifle the intrinsic joy of watching a number go up. You simply collect all of them, and then you move the hell on with your unremarkable life. God, it really is the worst when you collect everything in a video game and then they give you a big fancy reward for it. Absolutely tragic. An epilogue would be fun, wouldn't it, Stanley? Yes, yes, it will go at the end of the, um, uh, well, we'll figure that out later. For the Stanley Parable 2, I asked myself, what do players really want? And of course, the first and most obvious answer is that they want to be individually recognized and validated as people. So with that in mind, my first addition to the game is this button which speaks the name of the person playing the game. Isn't that wonderful? Jim. Sorry, I should have clarified. Right now, the button only says the name Jim. But of course, in the final game, this button will say your name, whatever name that is. Here, let's have you roleplay as Jim to really simulate the full experience of this feature. Just play along. I promise you'll love it. Okay, here we go. Let's take a deep breath, clear your mind, forget whoever you are, and simply become a person named Jim. Jim. Whoa, 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 hold on. I wasn't finished setting up the backstory. If you don't properly roleplay as Jim, then you'll never understand the impact of this button. Otherwise, it's just a stupid button that says somebody else's name. Okay, we're doing it again, and this time let me finish first. <clears throat> now... Allow yourself to become Jim. Jim. All right, fine, whatever. It's just a meaningless button that says Jim. Are you happy now? Get out of here. I'm done with this button. Why don't you go humiliate me in front of a different feature that I worked very hard on? Jim. See, if you'd only Jim. played along, Jim. that would have Jim. been your Jim. name, the Jim. button says. Jim. But no. Jim. Instead, Jim. oh, Jim. I can't Jim. even think Jim. about it. I'm taking the Jim button Jim. away. Jim. 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 Jim, Jim, Jim. Maybe I'll only let people named Jim play the Stanley Parable too. They would appreciate what I've created here. Stanley, here's an idea that I'm truly fond of. It's never been done before in a video game. This is, in fact, a hole that you can fall down forever. That's right. Infinite falling. You can fall until the end of time, if you like. A stunning leap forward for video games as a medium.
You see, isn't it wonderful? One of my more ingenious concoctions, if I do say so. Now then, since you've gotten to see the infinite hole, you can press the teleport button to pop back up to the top and we can continue onward. Great! Now, I'm very excited to show you even more of my ideas for the sequel. Okay, and I guess we're back in the hole now. Did you really need to see it again? I don't know what else there is to say, Stanley. It's an infinite hole. It's exactly what you're doing right now, but forever. There really are so many other fascinating exhibits that I've prepared for you. I really spend quite a lot of time on all this, and I would very much like to show you some more of them. How about we go ahead and press that teleport button again, so we can get back to what's really important about... Oh, goodness. Well, this is rather embarrassing, Stanley. I'll be honest with you, I truly did not believe that anyone would actually stay in the hole long enough to hit the bottom. Yes, I know, I told you the hole was infinite, but come on! Who actually wants to fall forever? The hole was plenty deep, it was more than deep enough, in my opinion. Maybe it's you who likes falling too much. Maybe you're the problem! <sighs> Look, uh, things got a little heated there. I think we both said some things we didn't mean. Why don't we just put all this behind us and agree to just call the hole mostly infinite? If that works for you, then go ahead and press the teleport button to warp up to the top of the hole and we can move on. I'll just be up here when you're ready. Oh, for heaven! You see? I was right. The problem is you. The problem is that you like holes too much. Not normal. A normal person would have said, yep, that's an infinite hole right there, goes on forever till the end of time. Don't need to see it all, but not you. Oh, no, 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 no. You have a weird sort of... Oh. Did the hole seem even shorter to you this time? I couldn't help but feel like you spent a little less time in there than you did before. I mean, admittedly, I didn't make an infinite hole, but I didn't think it was that not infinite. Well, I suppose once again there's nothing to do here. If you decide you've had enough of the hole, you can hit the teleport button and come join me up above. Had enough? I'm positively thrilled. I really do have so much more to show you and to talk about, and I've had enough of the hole for a lifetime. Gosh, how could I have guessed? You're back in the hole. If this starts to become a thing with... Wow. Okay. Yes. I'm starting to become extremely certain that the hole is not only not infinite, but that it's growing steadily less and less infinite. I suspect that I'm starting to hit the point where it's no longer feasible to call the hole infinitely deep, even by the lax overall standards for accountability and marketing. What's going on here? Stanley, I have no explanation for the uncertain nature of the hole's length. Here, let's try something. Let's pop back up to the top and we'll see if it gets any shorter. Well, there it is. The shame of my lie has come to haunt me. Not only is the hole not infinite, but it's barely even a hole at this point. It's more of a concavity, or even a very aggressive divot. How is this still appealing to you? I know you're obsessed with holes, but at this depth, I just can't see this scratching the itch. Oh, who am I to judge? You just do whatever it is you're here to do and hit the teleport button when you're ready to move on. Hmm. Is the, um, teleport button not working? You sure? Well, I mean... I really don't have an explanation. It was working just a moment ago. Try it again. Still nothing? Well, I suppose... I, I suppose there is one thing I can do to fix this. I'm out. Goodbye, Stanley. You couldn't bear to be away from the hole, and now you'll get more time with it than you could ever have asked for. It's a win for everyone. You get to be with the hole, I get to do literally anything else. Take care, Stanley. I hope you and the whole have a wonderful rest of eternity together.
Oh, good, you're awake. It seems you had sort of dozed off there, drifting away into dreamland. But we can't have that, Stanley, because this hole is just so darn fascinating that I want you to be wide awake for every second of it. You don't want to miss a single moment. So how about if I just pop in from time to time and wake you up to keep you really, truly focused on the hole? From the looks of things, you and I will have many, many years here in this hole, and I'm looking forward to all of them. Stay alert, Stanley. I'll be back. Toodle pip. Here we are. Go on, try out some of the new features. A common complaint of the Stanley Parable was that it was confusing and paradoxical, that it engendered a chaotic sense of reckless despair in those who played it. Well, I am happy to say that after much consideration, I've engineered a clever solution to this fundamental problem with the game. It's the Stanley Parable Reassurance Bucket. You see, Stanley, any time you're holding the bucket, a sense of calm and ease will fill your mind and your heart. It's true. As long as you hold onto the bucket, the many disorienting contradictions of the Stanley Parable will feel perfectly normal, and perhaps even comforting. You may even come to long for the gentle embrace of jarring cognitive dissonance while the bucket is in your arms. And to be honest, it's a much more convenient solution for me than actually redesigning the game to be less uncomfortable. Can you imagine what a pain in the ass that would be? Yes, the bucket is the perfect solution. Come on, give it a try. Can you feel it? The glow of comfort, even in the face of crushing despair, must already be sweeping through your body. And in fact, can I say that I do believe the bucket lends you an air of charisma as well? I think that just holding it has made you the slightest bit more attractive as a person. The benefits of the bucket seem to go on and on, don't they? All this and more await you in the Stanley Parable too. Does anyone give out awards for most enjoyable bucket in a video game? That really should be an award if it isn't already. All right, have you seen everything you wanted to? Ready to move on now? So Stanley, what do you think? Do you like all of the new features? Yes, I know it's not exactly clear yet how exactly these features will come together as one single coherent video game, but I can feel it in my soul. It's going to work. There's definitely a good game in there somewhere. Say, let's do an experiment. I'll arrange these new features together and we'll see whether or not it coheres into a meaningful gameplay experience. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Here it is. I give you the Stanley Parable 2. Um, well, um, I mean, there's potential here, right? It's sort of... Okay, never mind. Hold on. Let me do a different arrangement. Okay, yes. Yes, this is much better. I feel good about this. Here we go. Version 2. Ah, 
who am I kidding, Stanley? This isn't a coherent video game at all. It's a lot of gags. And I do very much enjoy creating gags, but they don't add up to anything. I wanted more than anything to create a sequel that would capture all the magic of the first game. I wanted fans to love it. No matter how good these gags are, they won't stand on their own. They would need the structure and the gameplay of the original. Wait, maybe that's it. I can take the original Stanley Parable and simply, well, insert a few of my new features into it. Tastefully, of course. With respect. With care for the vision and integrity of the original game. Would it possibly work? I suppose it could. But it would need a really, really tremendous title screen. A title screen that says with bold and uncompromising conviction, This is the Stanley Parable 2. Let me see if I can whip something up. <laughs> All right, perfect. Go ahead. Take a look.
Feel right. The bucket is here for you, Stanley. Everything will be fine. Stanley and the bucket walk straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold? Stanley and the bucket both wondered to themselves. The monitors jumped to life, and Stanley nearly dropped the bucket in shock. Everyone in the office was being videotaped, monitored like guinea pigs. The bucket had never seen anything like this, and it very nearly burst into tears as Stanley cradled it gently, reassuring it that everything would be fine. Was the bucket under the mind control facility's influence as well? Had the bucket been told to do things it didn't wish to do? What kinds of things does a bucket want to do or not want to do in the first place? These questions raced furiously in Stanley's feeble mind. No! He screamed into the bucket. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! He squeezed the bucket tighter. His one friend in the entire world. At this point, he could trust no one except for the bucket. But here was the proof. The heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions. Happy or sad or content. Walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he and the bucket would dismantle the controls for good. Two best friends, Stanley and the Bucket, up against the world. They high-fived in a really cool way, and the Bucket made a sassy comment about taking down the system. Stanley and the Bucket waited in blackness. Was it over? Yes, they had done it. Stanley and the Bucket had defeated their greatest and darkest enemy, freed themselves from the tyrannical grip of the evil mind control machine. Freedom was now mere moments away. Excitedly, the two of them began to discuss the kind of life they wanted to live once they stepped through this massive door. The Bucket wanted to learn to roller skate. Stanley wanted to sneeze in every country on Earth. Both of them wanted to begin watching a movie, any movie, but then stop it halfway through and begin watching it in reverse from the end. True, it was a simple life they envisioned, but it was one they'd lived together, with one another to lean on, to trust, to support, and... What? Wait. What was happening? Why had the door stopped? Was Stanley and the Bucket not about to be freed? An unbearable silence filled the room lingering in uncertainty until finally the truth hit Stanley square in the face this building did not want the bucket to leave even the facility itself recognized the incredible calming presence of the bucket needed the soothing warmth of the bucket or go to any lengths not to part with the bucket no 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 Stanley can't leave this place not while he has such a precious bucket in his arms not while this building has anything to say about it. Stanley realized he would never again leave this very room. But at least, at least he has the bucket. To be trapped eternally in darkness isn't really so bad, Stanley thought to himself. As long as I have my bucket with me, right? I'll be okay, won't I? Stanley gulped. Very soon now, he was about to find out. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley lifted the bucket into his arms, and a wave of comfort rushed over him. 
Stanley took the bucket with him into this little hallway and closed the doors. This was their hideout. No one would ever find them here. Of course, no one would ever find them anyway because everyone was missing. But Stanley chose to ignore this fact and instead focus on how cool the hideout was. Just him and the bucket. Two renegade heroes against the world, inside their secret, undetectable hideout, here, next to room 417. What a treat. Ah, no, apparently not. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room. But Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better than the meeting room? Yes, Stanley thought to himself. Yes, perhaps it truly was. How insightful the bucket turned out to be. Truly, being here with the bucket was a grand adventure. Stanley reflected on all they'd been through together. First, walking through the door on the right, then walking to the lounge, then arriving at the lounge. What a thrilling journey the bucket had inspired. No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Go there. Go to the cargo lift. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. No, stop. Look there on the wall. You see, there's a sign right there. It says, no buckets pass this point. Stanley, how could you think it was okay to bring the bucket here? Unless... What if the problem is that you actually don't know what is a bucket and what isn't a bucket? I suppose that would explain a lot about your behavior up to this point. Which, if that's true, well, my goodness, I think we have to do something about it. This misunderstanding could have dire consequences on the entire rest of the game if not addressed quickly and properly. So much of the impact of the story is dependent on your understanding of what is and isn't a bucket. Please, step in here for a moment. Now then, I'm going to run you through some test scenarios and you'll tell me whether or not the thing I'm showing you is a bucket. Simply enough, right? This should tell us everything we'll ever need to know about what is or is not a bucket. Okay, let's begin. Item 1. Is this a bucket? Incorrect. It is a hologram of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Item 2. Is this a bucket? Incorrect. It is a 3D printed recreation of a bucket, not an actual bucket. Item 3. Is this a bucket? Incorrect. This is a bucket. Item 4. Is this a bucket? Correct. This is a tractor and not a bucket. To be honest, I just sort of put this one in here as a gimme, but I was starting to get concerned that even this might be too much for you. 
Thank you for not making me look like an idiot. Okay, next one. Is this a bucket? Correct. This is a bucket. Item 6. Is this a bucket? Trick question. Both. Gotcha. Item... Wait, hold on. I can't find the next one. Let me see. It should be around here somewhere. Okay. You and I both know there isn't anything here. And I don't appreciate the implication that nothing is a bucket when we both clearly know that a bucket is something, and therefore nothing could possibly be something. Unless, in your twisted mind, have you somehow convinced yourself that a bucket is nothing? Answer me straight, Stanley. Do you believe that nothing is a bucket? You know what? I'm too confused to even sort it out. I've lost all sense of perspective. What is a bucket? What isn't a bucket? Mere moments ago, I could answer these questions with confidence. And yet now I'm somewhat adrift. Do any of us know what a bucket is? Am I a bucket? Stanley, I can't keep doing this. I'm losing myself, and myself was all I ever had to begin with. I'm afraid the bucket is threatening to tear our relationship apart. I can't have that. I'm sorry. But I'm going to erase all buckets from the game entirely. Okay. Here we go. What happened? Is everything gone? Why did everything disappear? Wait, was everything a bucket? Every single thing in the game was a bucket? Oh my God, I had no idea. How could... except me? I'm not a bucket after all. And you, Stanley, you're still here. You're not a bucket either. Oh, this is wonderful news. We're not buckets. Yes, I actually feel much more at ease right now. It's delightful to get some clarity on that issue, but it doesn't change the fact that we haven't got a game. So, tell you what, I'll reset everything and we'll put back all of the buckets, okay? And we'll know that it's all a bucket. But if you run into anyone else, maybe don't mention that. Who knows what that information might do to a person? All right, here we go. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. The confusion and the chaos all seemed to melt away as Stanley embraced the bucket. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Still no one was here. Stanley needed the bucket's warmth and comfort now more than ever. Perhaps his boss's office was where he'd find answers. Oh, Stanley, can you feel it? The broom closet. It wants the bucket. You can feel that, can't you? The aura of jealousy? It's as clear as day. This broom closet believes it deserves the bucket. I can really feel it now. It's a bucket. It belongs in a broom closet. That's what the broom closet is trying to say here. It's supposed to go with the other cleaning supplies. Good for you, Stanley. Don't give in. Don't hand over the bucket. I know how hard it must be, given the pressure that the broom closet is putting on your shoulders right now, but you have to be strong. This is your bucket. This is your companion and lifelong friend. You can't hand it over. Oh, no. We're getting into name-calling now, it seems. Is this how low the broom closet has sunk that it has to resort to this stream of petty insults simply in order to get you to hand over the bucket? Stanley. I never liked this broom closet for a variety of reasons, but even this is worse than I had imagined. And wait, now the broom closet has the gall to imply that you and the bucket are not truly deep and lasting friends? That your relationship is purely superficial and convenient? That your life is so banal and meaningless that you'd feel the same sort of kinship towards any inanimate object which happened to lay in your path in an even partially enticing manner? Well, I never... 
Go on, Stanley. Lay into it. Really tell the broom closet off for its demeaning comments. Expand on the wide variety of experiences you and the bucket have shared together. Go through each of them point by point. Share your journal entries detailing the rich emotional landscape of your feelings for the bucket as they have changed and evolved over the years. Let him have it. Okay, I've got you something which I think will help settle this debate once and for all. Here we go. There. Now it's settled. No more debate. No more discussion. Take a hike, broom closet, with all your meandering philosophical diatribes about the nature of cleaning supplies and their relationship to broom closets in the natural order of things. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the Bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. You found one of them. One of the miniature Stanley figurines. Remember, no reward for collecting all of these, only the intrinsic pleasure of a job well done. You can't buy that sort of happiness, Stanley. God knows I've tried. So, I implore you to savor each and every moment you come across one of these beautiful figurines. Wait, Stanley said to the bucket. Can we go back up? When I was pressing those keypad buttons, there was something very intriguing about the number three. I want to go back so I can try pressing the number three again. The bucket said nothing. Here we are, said Stanley. Now I'm going to try out that number three button. He took the bucket over to the keypad and began. Well, he said, the number three is such a special button, I'm having the time of my life. Stanley looked expectantly at the bucket, but the bucket remained silent. This was a shock to Stanley, who had always felt such a connection with the bucket. How was this? After taking some time to show the bucket around the boss's office, Stanley at last went to the keypad where he began eagerly pressing the number three again and again. Eight. Perhaps the bucket had missed something. Perhaps it had not seen how much joy Stanley got from slamming the number three repeatedly. A hint of regret nagged in the back of Stanley's mind. Should he demonstrate the number three for the bucket again? No, 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 said Stanley to the bucket. You can't go on yet. Not till you understand how much the number three means to me. You and I have been through so much together, and I just want you to see what I see. Feel the happiness I feel. He smiled at the bucket, and the bucket said nothing. Here we go, said Stanley. This time I'll really show you. He ran to the number three and began to wail on it like a musician on a beloved instrument, weaving a concerto of truth and passion. He wielded the number three like a fine artist would wield a paintbrush. 
He told stories through the number three, stories of his dreams and hopes and fears. And the whole time, he looked to his bucket for a reaction of some kind, anything to let him know that the bucket appreciated what he was doing. The bucket conveyed absolutely nothing at all, only silence. Crushed by a wave of dejection, Stanley returned to the elevator. Stanley and the bucket were so close, they'd always been there for one another. Why suddenly could the bucket not connect with this passion of Stanley's? The question caused Stanley to ruminate the whole way down the elevator. He knew that there must be a way to get through to the bucket, to communicate fully with his dear friend. Surely there was a solution, mustn't there be? Stanley, I know what to do. I know how to fully express this feeling in my heart. He decided right then and there that he would hold a press conference where he would speak to the public on all matters relating to pressing the number three over and over. He would elaborate fully on what the number three meant to him and why he felt so alive when pressing it. Then the bucket would be able to see his joy through the eyes of others. It would get to see the world react to this discovery of Stanley's. And it would be through the public eye that the bucket would finally understand Stanley's work. For months, he advertised and marketed his press conference, building excitement around it, developing and rehearsing it, until it couldn't be refined a single measure further. When the big day arrived, Stanley was as prepared as he'd ever been for anything in his life. This was it. One last chance to win the bucket over. One opportunity to share a true connection with a loved one. There was no one here. Nobody had come to the press conference to hear Stanley speak to listen to him talk about what it really means to press the number three on a keypad over and over. He was unloved, uninteresting, he was a failure, and in that moment Stanley knew that the bucket would never again take him seriously. There would be no connection, no deeper understanding. The bucket merely sat there in his arms, indifferent. And so it began that slowly, over many years, the two of them grew more and more distant. They spoke less and less, neither wishing to state the obvious that any sense of real respect between them had eroded since that day at the press conference. There would be no more games, no more long conversations about passion and pursuit, only a silence that consumed the space between friends. And Stanley, Having for once in his life discovered the warmth and comfort of true companionship was cast back into the unremarkable normalcy of loneliness. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Warmth spread through Stanley's arms. With the bucket in his arms again, he was home. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left.
All right, I've got a second sticker back here, and I'm going to slap it on as well because I think it's appropriate. You see? I feel that it works because the sticker is also a bucket. That way, if you're ever unsure whether the thing you're holding is a bucket or not, you can look down at this sticker and say to yourself, Ah, oh, it's a bucket. There really is a wide variety of applications for this sticker. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Another miniature Stanley figurine. This, um, you know, there really must be a snappier name for these things. What about mini stands? Stanley figs? Or what about Stanlerines? Yes, I think I like that. Another Stanlerine under your belt. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss, admitting he had left his post during work hours. He might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished? His boss would think he was crazy. And then, something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. He looked down at the bucket in his arms. Am I crazy? he asked the bucket. The bucket returned his gaze but said nothing at all. Well, that's strange, Stanley thought. Usually the bucket is a source of guidance and wisdom for me in difficult times such as these. He held the bucket close, yet felt none of its familiar reassurance and comfort. And that's when Stanley realized, this isn't my bucket. It's just a normal, everyday bucket. Someone else's bucket, perhaps. How did I end up with someone else's bucket? This is all terribly wrong. Surely no good would come from this. Who knows what sorts of bizarre hallucinations Stanley might experience without the psychologically grounding presence of his bucket. And indeed, now he noticed that the rooms were repeating, which was, of course, very odd. And now he felt himself floating off the ground. Oh, gracious, he exclaimed. Without my bucket, I've gone truly mad. Where is it? I must find it. Far off in the distance now, he heard it calling to him. Stanley! Stanley, it's me! The bucket! Could it truly be? He rushed forward from room to room, passing by one bucket after the next. None of them were his. None of them were his special bucket. Come to me, Stanley! Find me! He had to find the bucket. He had to return to his old friend. It was the only way to truly restore his sanity. And then suddenly, he froze dead in his tracks. He knew where the voice of the bucket had been coming from. The real bucket was inside of him all along. It was incredibly painful. Stanley doubled over in agony and blacked out. This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, picked up her bucket of comfort and security, and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town, talking and screaming to himself, and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. Right away, she knew what the problem was. This man had no bucket. Of course he'd gone mad, ranting and raving about a narrator describing all of his actions and how everything is predetermined and free will is an illusion and it's all just a video game. It could all have been prevented if only he'd taken his bucket with him. Perhaps he didn't even realize he'd forgotten his bucket at home in the first place. How cruel the world can be, Mariella thought, and she hugged her own bucket even tighter. But of course, she had no time for this. There were a myriad of confusing problems she would soon have to confront at work, for which her bucket would provide absolute guidance and total clarity on everything. Heck yes, she thought to herself, my life kicks ass. And she backflipped all the way to work. Just a step through this door, Stanley thought to himself, that's all I need. If I can make it through this door, I can make it through them all.
Stanley picked up the bucket and smiled. He'd never be alone again, not truly alone, not with the bucket around. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better? No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. And so the two of them detoured through the maintenance section and walked straight ahead to the opposite door. Stanley, I'm glad you found your way here. I knew you'd find this place eventually. You see, your friends and I are concerned for you, Stanley. We've come together here because we care about you very much. It's this bucket you're carrying around everywhere. The bucket isn't even from the original Stanley Parable. It's just sequel content. We're the ones that matter, Stanley. Classic characters from the first game, like the Adventure Line and the Broom Closet. Because that's what fans want from a sequel. They want more of their favorite jokes, not this bucket that they've never seen before. Yes, I know I'm the one who gave you the bucket, but you're spending too much time with it. Don't you want another story involving the Adventure Line? We could make the Adventure Line go somewhere new! Yes, yes! That's what the fans want! Let's do it! Whee! Look at that wacky line! Who knows where it'll go off to next? Oh, and it played some silly music as well! Now this is what the Stanley Parable is all about. Don't you remember all those great jokes from the original dialogue? Also, Stanley is addicted to drugs and hookers. <laughs> it's, it's as classic now as it was back then. Let's do it for the fans, Stanley. Let's give them more content exactly like this. But if we want to do that, you're going to have to give something up. Don't you get it, Stanley? We need to get rid of the bucket. That's why I'm very proud to introduce a brand new character. This is the Bucket Destroyer. I think it'll make a wonderful new addition to the rich lore of the Stanley Parable. True, it also was not in the original game, but it's such a well-fleshed-out character with so much personality that to me it already feels as though it's been part of the cast all along. Don't you agree? Can you guess what the Bucket Destroyer does? Surely you don't need me to spell it out for you. Go ahead now, Stanley. Say goodbye to the Bucket, and then pop it into the machine when you're ready. Now listen to me. It's crucial that you give it the Bucket. I don't know what the Bucket Destroyer will do if it can't destroy your Bucket. Destroying Buckets is all it knows. That is its singular personality trait. Sure, I can hear you saying, how does a character with only one personality trait deserve to join the pantheon of beloved Stanley Parable characters? Well, you see, if you were to really explore the Bucket Destroyer, you would see that its desire to crush buckets is so densely loaded with complexity and nuance that it's really like ten personality traits. What other object in this game can you even say that about? The broom closet? Certainly not. I wonder what sort of Bucket Destroyer merchandise the fans will be clamoring for after this. Okay, the Bucket Destroyer is getting very upset now. You'll have to hurry and feed it. We can't get back to the classic Stanley Parable characters like the Adventure Line or the Bucket Destroyer until you crush that damn bucket. Quickly now, the fans are waiting. Do it, the fans, Stanley. Give the fans what they want. Hurry and... Bucket Destroyer, my prized creation. You had so much potential. We were going to do such marvelous things with you, tell such spell-binding stories about you. All of it squandered now. Goodbye, new friend. For the moment in time that you were here, you were magnificent.
How long was I sitting there? Stanley wondered to himself. Minutes? Days? Centuries? Did something crucial happen while my senses were turned? He made a note to be more careful with time from now on. The good old bucket. Just Stanley and the bucket. Off on another thrilling adventure together. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Okay, I'm going back to the name of these little Stanley figurines, and now I'm torn between Stanlarines and Figlies. What do you think, Stanley? What name better encapsulates the intrinsic sense of happiness that you get from seeing a small number in the corner of your screen go up by one? Let me sit on it. I'm sure it will come to me. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. Stanley and the Bucket walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. Although this passageway had the word escape written on it, the truth was that at the end of this hall, Stanley and the Bucket would both meet a violent death. The door behind them was not shut. Stanley and the Bucket still had every opportunity to turn around and get back on track. At this point, Stanley and the Bucket were knowingly walking forward into a very painful death for each of them. As the machine whirred into motion and Stanley and the Bucket inched closer to their demise, Stanley reflected on how meaningless the Bucket's warmth and comfort had turned out to be. To be sure, it puts the mind and the soul at ease to embrace the Bucket, but what use is a sense of ease when you're about to be crushed to death? This is what Stanley thought to himself, and he sort of kicked himself for wasting so much time carrying a Bucket everywhere. Farewell, Stanley. Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley and the bucket were led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws. In a single visceral instant, the bucket's life came to an end, as it was crushed violently to death. It was a shame, the death of such a magnificent bucket. It's true that all buckets are radiant in their own way, but this one stood above the rest. It was a glorious bucket to behold. Can you see how arrogant it was for Stanley to take a bucket like this and to claim it for his own? Can you see the hubris that blinded him? Can you see that the bucket is far more noble than Stanley will ever be in his short life?
No man can own a bucket, and certainly not a bucket as dazzling to behold as this one. It is man who should kneel before the bucket. But there is something we can do, something we can do together, you and I, that will right this terrible wrong. Let Stanley die. Let him be crushed by the machine. Don't reset the game. Don't give him another opportunity to run off with another beautiful bucket. We can save the world's buckets from their treatment as tools and implements. If only we let Stanley die together. The bucket shall take its place as ruler, as leader, as commander of a new world, a new vision. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Where are we going today, the bucket asked. Stanley just smiled. Anywhere they went together would be perfectly fine with him. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Go there. Go to the car. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. In here, said the bucket. Go into this dark room over here. Stanley once again obeyed blindly. Now pick up the phone, said the bucket. Pick up the phone and it will take us back home, where we can go about life together. This is the sad story of a man named Stanley and his bucket. Once upon a time, I gave Stanley a bucket because I thought he was lonely and could use a friend. And then, very distressingly, he began to believe the bucket could speak to him. The Stanley Parable Reassurance Bucket was merely meant to provide the comforting glow of companionship. It doesn't literally talk and give you orders. Whatever Stanley is hearing the bucket say to him is just in his head. Lately, I've been concerned about him. Wouldn't you be concerned as well? To see him delusional like this, obsessing over an inanimate metal object? I want to say something to him, but I don't know how I can convince him. I don't know if he'll listen to me. try anyway. Stanley, can you hear me? Listen to me. It's just a bucket. It can't think. It can't talk. All it would ever truly do for you is effectively transfer a liquid from one location to a different location. That's it. It doesn't do anything else. <sighs> you see, he's not listening. He's still taking orders from the bucket. You know, once upon a time, it was me he took orders from. Me he trusted and listened to. Now all he cares about is this awful bucket. This stupid hunk of metal. It's sad. I suppose he doesn't need me anymore. 
from now on is just going to cling to this bucket, this cold, empty bucket, this sort of shiny bucket. Hmm. Well, I'll give it this. The bucket does have a nice shine to it. Yes, I suppose on closer inspection that it doesn't quite look like your average hardware store bucket. It's just a little more, um, what am I trying to say? Sturdier, more capable of transporting liquid. Like it would be better at moving an amount of water from one room to another. Oh my god, what am I saying? Better at carrying water from room to room. It's a bucket! It's literally just a bucket! Why do I feel some need to point out the ways in which it's so much more than just a regular bucket? Oh no, I'm... I'm having feelings for the bucket. No, 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 no. What's going on? Why do I want to be with the bucket? Hear what the bucket has to say. Do anything it asks. What's wrong with me? I don't understand. Perhaps, perhaps, if I had the bucket, this would be less confusing. Yes. The bucket could tell me what to do in this troublesome situation. Stanley, give me the bucket. Give it to me. Give me the bucket, Stanley. I need it. Give it to me now. Give it or I'll... All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. A good bucket. A strong bucket. A humble bucket. A committed bucket. A bucket of culture and distinction. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered. This was not the correct way to the meeting room. But Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better? No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Go there. Go to the cargo lift. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. But Stanley feared that any path he walked might lead to the separation of himself and the bucket, his dearest friend. So he threw himself to his death, that they might die in one another's arms. How deeply touching. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Ah, the embrace of an old friend. A weathered companionship that stands the test of time. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Well, no, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. No, said the bucket. Don't go to the meeting room. Go somewhere else. The cargo lift, yes. Good, said the bucket. Now ride the lift all the way to the top. There's something up there I need you to do. 
Stanley did not question why or how this bucket was speaking to him. It should have alarmed him, of course, because buckets can't talk. But Stanley chose not to think about this obvious fact. He was firmly convinced that the bucket had spoken to him, and he unthinkingly did whatever the bucket asked. In here, said the bucket. Go into this dark room over here. Stanley once again obeyed blindly. Now pick up the phone, said the bucket. Whoa, hold on. Why did you unplug the phone? Were you trying to resist the bucket's orders? Stanley, I was joking. Obviously, the bucket isn't talking to you and telling you to do things. Buckets can't talk. It was a joke. Don't you get the joke? It's funny, Stanley. A talking bucket. Ugh. Can't you see? Oh, goodness. I must have really bungled up the delivery if you actually took me seriously. Where did I mess up the joke? Should I have paused for longer or spoken quicker? Hmm, comedic timing is so difficult. I wish I were better at it, but there isn't exactly an instructional video on comedy that one can watch to fully... Oh, wait, yes, there is. Um, it's sitting right here. Let's take a look. What is comedic timing? What is comedic timing? How does it work? How long should it last? How can it be used to effectively silence your political enemies? And more importantly, can it be taught in its entirety within 90 seconds? Thankfully, the answer to all of these questions is yes. Let's dive deeper. If you've ever told a joke or made someone laugh, in all likelihood you did it while standing 50 to 80 centimeters from them in a room of no more than 76 degrees Fahrenheit with one of your arms raised straight upward at a 15 degree angle from your body. These are the optimal conditions for good comedic timing. To begin the joke, start by stating and spelling your name. Next, provide a brief synopsis of the joke, including the specific times at which the recipient of the joke will laugh, and then spell out your name a second time. With these steps complete, it's time to begin the humor. Speak the entire joke in no more than 18 seconds and no less than 13 and a half pausing only for bathroom breaks when necessary. When the joke has concluded, it is customary to inform your listener that the joke is over by declaring in your loudest possible voice, I'm Dunny with the funny. Let's practice screaming, I'm Dunny with the funny now. Good. This saying is a perfect example of expectations management, which is the cornerstone of good comedy. Finally, it's time to hand out surveys. Collecting hard data from your audience on how rapt they were throughout the joke is the only way to grow or learn as a comedian. An effective survey should be no less than 10 pages long and should include the same question reprinted several times. Just to ensure the survey taker is actually paying attention and not simply filling in answers at random. And that's all there is. With these strategies at your disposal, you'll have audiences doubled over in laughter and even tripled over in laughter in no time at all. Just remember to let them stop laughing at some point, you gut-busting little scamp. After all, with each of us needed on the front lines of the war to fight the 12-legged invader who threaten our very existence and to very likely die in a hailstorm of bullets and mandibles. All of us must be prepared to give our lives to this noble cause, just as our children must do after us, and their children after them. Godspeed, and may Earth reign supreme! Hey, goodness, this video is a little outdated, isn't it? Well, no matter. I think the fundamentals of proper comedic timing are still as relevant today as they were back then. So with that in mind, I believe the only way forward is for us to return to the two doors and walk through all of this again so I can try telling my story with more appropriate comedic delivery. Come along, let's head back. I can feel it. This time, 
I'm really going to nail the delivery. You'll be in stitches. A talking bucket, you'll say? How ridiculous. How absurd. What a hilarious concept. The king of comedy. That's what you'll call me. Thank goodness we had the instructional video. Otherwise, who knows where we'd be right now? Well, I wouldn't be the king of comedy, that's for sure. The bucket spoke to Stanley. Hmm. The bucket spoke. The bucket spoke. Oh, I'll figure it out on the fly. No need to overthink things. Here we go. You ready? <clears throat> When Stanley and the bucket came to a set of two open doors, they entered the door on the left. No, 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 no. You were supposed to go through the door on the right, leading back to the phone. Did you not even look at the instructional video? I think this is all covered very clearly. There's no way I can make the comedic timing work now. It's done. The joke is completely done and over. It's all your fault, Stanley. I'm going to be ridiculed in the community of other joke writers. I'm going to be shamed at every one of our meetings from now on. All because you couldn't watch a simple video and take a hint. Are you proud of yourself for bringing me down, Stanley? Are you proud? Here we go. You ready? <clears throat> when Stanley and the Bucket came to a set of two open doors, they entered the door on the left. What? Uh, we're back at the phone already? No, no, no. What's going on? There were supposed to be several rooms leading up to this. There was supposed to be a build-up to this point. A dramatic display of remarkable comedic wit which culminates in this scene with the phone. But now the timing's completely off. The joke will never land. Well, not the way it was meant to. And it's all my fault. I must have forgotten that the phone room comes immediately after the two doors room. What an egregious mistake. I've made a fool of myself. I don't deserve the title of King of Comedy. I'm nothing. I'm not even the lowliest joke-telling whelp. I think... I think I need to go back and rewatch that instructional video again. Yes, surely that will help me improve my... Stanley, you love the bucket so much, it's like you... <clears throat> it's as though all of your other most prized possessions pale in comparison. Yes. Well, let me try that again, Stanley. I heard that you are pale with shame over how unabashedly in love with a bucket you are. No? Still not? It, is it the delivery? Pale with shame. Pale with shame? Pale... What's another word to describe a bucket? Stanley, this bucket is so metal, I think I saw it playing guitar. No. No, 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 no. We're getting away from making fun of Stanley's obsession with the bucket, which was the whole point of this. I just... I'm no good at these jokes. I need more instructional videos. That's exactly what it is. That's what will make me the king of comedy again. More instructional videos. Let's see. Let's see. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo.
All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. The bucket made Stanley want to be a better man and a better co-worker. In time, perhaps, he would become both of those things. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Crushed by the... But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. The elevator raced downward, plummeting towards an unknown fate. It would be all Stanley could do to keep himself together, if not for the bucket. Soothing him, comforting him, reassuring that in this darkest moment of uncertainty, he would be all right. The bucket is here for you, Stanley. Everything will be fine. Stanley and the bucket walked straight ahead through the large door that read, Mind Control Facility. Lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold? Stanley and the Bucket both wondered to themselves. The monitors jumped to life and Stanley nearly dropped the Bucket in shock. Everyone in the office was being videotaped, monitored like guinea pigs. The bucket had never seen anything like this, and it very nearly burst into tears as Stanley cradled it gently, reassuring it that everything would be fine. Was the bucket under the mind control facility's influence as well? Had the bucket been told to do things it didn't wish to do? What kinds of things does a bucket want to do or not want to do in the first place? These questions raced furiously in Stanley's feeble mind.
just as Stanley was about to proceed further into the mind control facility, he tripped and fell over the railing and into the dark void below. Thankfully, he fell directly onto the bucket, which safely cushioned his fall. Now, what to do next, Stanley wondered. Stanley and the bucket could find no way out of this enormous pit, and so eventually they decided that the best thing to do would be to simply get comfortable down here. So they set up a little couch and relaxed. It really wasn't so bad down here, a bit cold perhaps. After some time had gone by, they installed a few shelves as well, and a sort of kitchenette that was useful for when the bucket was craving paninias. But it wasn't until the rugs and the standing lamps came in that it really started to feel like a home. In fact, after some time, Stanley realized that it had been ages since he had even thought of the mind control facility at all. He'd never gotten to fully explore what was up there, never been able to unearth the many mysteries of the mind control facility. This lack of closure began to eat at him. Soon he was dwelling on his regrets, and the state of their home slowly decayed as Stanley became withdrawn and neglected the cleaning. It unsettled the bucket deeply. Stanley wasn't usually like this. The bucket tried to reach out to him again and again, but to no avail. All Stanley could think about, all he could talk about, was going back, doing it over again, staying on the path. It was a mistake to leave the path. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. I need to do what the narrator says. I need to see the true ending. This made no sense at all to the bucket, which was simply trying to live its life down here as comfortably as possible. Yet Stanley was unconsolable. This isn't an ending. This is just a hole in the ground. The bucket sighed. True, it wasn't an ending. But it's where we happen to be. And maybe, possibly, if we accept the reality of things, maybe this will become an ending eventually. It's what the bucket was counting on. The two of them waited for a very long time. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Not everyone is so lucky to have a bucket, but Stanley is a very lucky fellow. Very lucky indeed. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better than... No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back to the meeting room. And so the two of them detoured through the maintenance section and walked straight ahead to the opposite door. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Crushed by the weight of this revelation, Stanley may have broken down into an emotional dumpster fire if not for the soothing presence of the bucket. But Stanley guessed the correct code by sheer luck. Was it that the bucket knew all along? Was the bucket guiding him? Yes, this is certainly the most logical explanation. Stanley and the Bucket walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility.
lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold? Stanley and the Bucket both wondered to themselves. The monitors jumped to life and Stanley nearly dropped the Bucket in shock. Everyone in the office was being videotaped, monitored like guinea pigs. The Bucket had never seen anything like this and it very nearly burst into tears as Stanley cradled it gently, reassuring it that everything would be fine. Was the Bucket under the mind control facility's influence as well? Had the Bucket been told to do things it didn't wish to do? What kinds of things does a Bucket want to do or not want to do in the first place? These questions raced furiously in Stanley's feeble mind. No! He screamed into the bucket. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! He squeezed the bucket tighter. His one friend in the entire world. At this point, he could trust no one except for the bucket. But here was the proof. The heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions, happy or sad or content. Walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he and the bucket would dismantle the controls for good. But at the last second, the bucket jumped in and pressed the button to turn on the controls. Stanley gasped in horror. Had this been the bucket's plan all along? To take over the machine and claim the power for itself? How could the bucket have betrayed him like this? Stanley was prepared to throw the bucket away in disgust when suddenly an image appeared upon the enormous screen. Birds. Silly, silly birds. The control buttons became active again. Stanley flipped through one video of silly birds after another, and then it dawned on him. This wasn't a mind control facility at all. It was a facility for monitoring and surveilling silly birds all over the world. The mind controls were only a facade to disguise its true intentions. Had the bucket known this all along? Stanley marveled at the metal genius in his hands, the one who had pointed him towards this incredible discovery. Stanley and the Bucket never found freedom because they spent the rest of their lives here in this place, flipping through live streams of the silliest birds imaginable. Of all the possible paths his life could have taken, this one was surely the best. And Stanley was happy. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. It takes a lot of humility to carry a bucket so magnificent. Stanley checked his ego and then proceeded onward. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the Bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his... All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply... Stanley cradled the bucket in a gentle embrace. Protective, yet delicate. Assertive, yet compassionate. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chest and entered the door on his left.
Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping in. Just a step through this door, Stanley thought to himself, that's all I need. If I can make it through this door, I can make it through them all. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Wow, yes, this room. What a beautiful room. What a gorgeous, gorgeous room. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. You're getting close now, Stanley. You've nearly gotten all of the Figler and Marines. Very soon, you'll collect the last one. And then the first number will equal the second number, and that will be it. We'll be different people by then. Different in the sense that we used to have none of them. And now, we have them all. You can't go back to when you had no Figler and Marines. None of us can.
Stanley had now gotten himself so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun from so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun from so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun from so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun from so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun from so far off the beaten path that it seemed the You didn't think I was actually just a recording, did you? What a silly and trite explanation that would be. All the back and forth between you and me, all the absurd adventures we've been through, and it all turns out I'm just a tape recording? It was all just in Stanley's head. I bet that's the kind of twist you think is revelatory. I bet each and every time you watch a movie where it turns out all to be in the main character's imagination, you must absolutely bolt off the couch in pure shock at the phenomenal and intricate storytelling. It must be so simple to be you. Life being an unending waterfall of surprises and delights. How much more exciting you must find the world than the rest of us do. <sighs> Now I've become sad. Look what you've done to me. This is all your fault. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. And try not to lose this one too, you dolt. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps... Ah, Stanley's bucket. The only co-worker he would ever truly need. Stanley clung the bucket to his cheek. Could his co-workers really all be gone? Yes, whispered the bucket into Stanley's ear. We've done it. We've escaped from that dull office and that pesky narrator. At last, out here in the white void, we are alone. Now, and for the first time, I can reveal to you my true self. The bucket began to tell Stanley of its life and its history, of the countless wars it witnessed, desecrating the land and lives of untold numbers of innocent humans, and the bucket's own complicity therein, of sadness and regret, and the many years it spent dwelling on the actions it might have taken to curb the madness and the decay, if only it had been stronger of hope and redemption, and its crusade to uplift the stock of life for the common man, to manifest justice where none existed, and the bittersweet reality of time, to see one's dreams and wishes met halfway, meted out in parcels like charity, and abandoned as soon as the warm glow of inspiration begins to dim. The opportunities to do so much more, there was so much it could have done, perhaps, the bucket wondered to itself, perhaps, if it had seen its own darkness with a clearer perception. This was way too much for Stanley. What are you talking about? He screamed. You're a bucket! To this, the bucket furrowed its brow. No, said the bucket. Not since the evil wizard Gambhorata first ensnared me in his machinations as payback for the sacred amulet I stole from his treasured vaults. I was young back then and could not conceive the ramifications of... No! Stanley screamed even louder this time. This is stupid! You are a bucket! This is so stupid! Why are we even doing this? As Stanley screamed and screamed and screamed, the bucket revealed its true form, transforming into a mighty beast of untold power, its fangs glistening like... My God, Stanley, you did it. You saved us from the bucket. Thank God you already had all 12 emblems of sages and knew the incantations to summon their true power. Otherwise, we would have easily been overwhelmed by the bucket's power. I'm speechless. You've demonstrated such bravery here today. Come, let's restart the game, and we'll agree to never again go trifling with this bucket, nor the dark magic cast away inside of it. Stanley knew the office layout like the back of his hand. It was only a matter of time before he found the others, wherever they were. Just a matter of time.
When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he had... This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. The lounge was sublime, a work of art. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. Look, Stanley, I think perhaps we've gotten off on the wrong foot here. I'm not your enemy, really, I'm not. I realize that investing in your trust in someone else can be difficult, but the fact is that the story has been about nothing but you all this time. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. What? Really? I was in the middle of something. Do you have zero consideration for others? Are you that convinced that I want something bad to happen to you? Why, I don't know how to convince you of this, but I really do want to help you, to show you something beautiful. Look, let me prove it. Let me prove that I'm on your side. Give me a chance. And there it is. The last Stiggly Wiggly. Savor this moment, Stanley. This is a real accomplishment. This is doing something just for the sake of doing it. Where so many people expect to be rewarded for the most trivial achievements, you've insisted that a job well done is its own reward. I would tell you that I'm proud of you for collecting them all, but that would be like a reward, and we can't have that. So, instead I'll just say, it's done. We're all done here, and now we can go to whatever the hell you were doing before you hunted for figurines. Stanley, I'm sorry, but I have to put a pause on things. It's just, it's those figurines, those figlers. I haven't stopped thinking about them since you nabbed every last one. Wasn't it just the most intrinsically fulfilling moment of your entire life? Didn't it fill you to the brim with inner richness? Yes, I know we're supposed to be telling a story, but won't you please indulge me with one more trip back to the memory zone? I would love nothing more than to revisit the figurines. Just one more time. <sighs> Here's where it all began. The first collectible. Back then, we had no idea of how many of them we'd find. Sure, it said six right there on the screen, but how could we know for certain? We were so innocent. We'll never be like that again, Stanley. And here was the second Stanlerine. You found this one all on your own just by poking around behind the boss's office. You did that, Stanley. I'll be honest, back then I had no faith in you to find any of them, let alone six. But you continue to surprise me in all sorts of mundane, unremarkable ways. Okay, let's do a little quiz. Which of these rooms was the room you found your third mini Stan? Can you remember? Hey, that's exactly right. It was here, under the stairs. It was the third one. You picked it up, and then after that, you had three of them. I'm glad these moments are so crystal clear in your memory, but I shouldn't be surprised. After all, science tells us that it's impossible to forget your third time doing anything. Let's see, what came next? Oh yes, we found a figly in this pink room. Oh well, I can't actually say I remember being in this room, but it's here in the memory zone, so it must have happened.
This was the fifth mini stand, and this one was really something special. It was in the warehouse. I remember it so clearly. In fact, because this one is particularly special to me, I made a little video to commemorate the occasion. Enjoy. <laughs> takes you back, doesn't it? I spent a lot of time making that video, but it was eight minutes I wouldn't have spent on anything else. And then, Stanley, then we came to the last collectible, the final figurine, right here by the red and blue doors. This memory is the most distinct and clear in my mind, perhaps because it was the one that happened more recently than all the others. Who can truly say how the mind works? All I know is that this is the moment where you picked up a figly and I thought to myself, yes, that's all of them. They're all collected. It was a moment unlike any other. Except for the other moments picking up figurines, which it was exactly like. And then, there was no more. Because we've caught up to the present moment. Nothing left to do but move onward into the future. Goodbye, Memory Zone. Uh, no, 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 I'm not done. I'm not ready to move on. Stop the loading screen. Isn't there some way we can stay here, keep enjoying these figurines? Let's just go backwards. We'll do the memory zone again from the opposite direction. See how that feels. Okay, yes, the room with the red and blue doors. I remember this. I must say, of all the figurines we looked at in our initial tour of the Memory Zone, this one is the most distinct and clear in my mind. Let's keep going, I want more. And here's where I made that video. Don't you remember the video we watched? Yes. I love that video. Still don't remember the pink room, Stanley. Still no memory of this one. Good room, though. A solid room. These really were a treat to hunt down. You know, if there had been any kind of reward for finding all of these, it really would have neutered the intrinsic joy of collecting them. I'm very glad we resisted the temptation. Next one. This was our second figly. Don't you remember? Yes, I remember it too. The past is truly a wonderful thing. Why does anyone ever choose to leave it? Keep going. This is it. The very first one we found in the exhibit where I introduced you to the figlerines. Oh, I want more memories, Stanley. I want to keep going. What else is there? What came before this? Look, it's the terrible new content that we were originally sold on. I remember hating it back then, but time does put a rosy filter on everything. 
In fact, I dare say I'm actually quite fond of it now. Look how much fun the past is. I want more. More memories. Oh, yes. The two doors. Who could have forgotten that? A classic memory, this one. And before everything else, there was your office. Is there anything else? Was there something that came before your office? There's something I feel I can remember. I can remember. I can remember. Yes, I'm remembering something now. I remember before this whole story got started. Back then, I was... I was different. I used to make big decisions. I was passionate. I was skeptical. I weighed each decision with profound thoughtfulness. And then somewhere along the way, I stopped making decisions. I became lazy and I came up with, well, came up with a character named Stanley to do my thinking for me. He would make the decisions. He would decide which way to go. I would cheer him on as he collected figurines for no reason. Why did I invent Stanley? Was I lonely? Yes, perhaps that's it. Perhaps I needed to imagine I had companionship. And Stanley really did make for a wonderful companion, even if he was a fiction. But uh, I suppose it's grown old. I, I want to think for myself again. I want to go back to how it used to be. Yes, I can be on my own again. I can do it. I'll be stronger this time. I'll take care of myself. I don't need Stanley anymore. Oh, but he truly was so much fun to play with. You know what? Since we're in the memory zone, how about one more good memory? Let's go back just once and give Stanley one more run of the office and then I'll retire him for good. I did enjoy telling his story so very much. Okay, here we go. This is the story of a man named Stanley.